Mm -mm -mm. I think it's time to talk about some memes. All right, all right, all jokes aside, we're going to talk about Men, the Alex Garland feature film. Came out like a year ago. I just saw it on Hulu. I saw the previews in the theater. Things were still a little weird, so I decided not to see it. And then I was like, oh, it's free on streaming. Got to catch this. And then I saw a lot of people didn't seem to understand the ending or didn't even want to address it. So... People seem to enjoy my previous attempts to explain a, a movie. I did Run Rabbit Run, which uh, can be seen up here. But we're going to talk about men, and I'm going to help you understand what did it all mean? What was the point of men? I think it's a good one, but let's get into it. I'm the man you may know, Z, from Our Views Will Kill You, and we appreciate any support you want to give. But let's talk about some mans. So here I'm going to show you some reviews. Just some people who seem to misunderstand this because men came out during the Me Too's, right? And an awful lot of people seem to misunderstand what men is about. So it looks like men, a horror movie about misogyny, misogyny, and what it should have had more to say about the misogyny. If you're not aware, Alex Garland is the writer director of Ex Machina, one of my favorite movies ever, and Annihilation, one of my most frustrating movies ever. I think the guy has a real keen eye for things, but he's not one to spoon feed you anything. He's also not one to even explain what's going on. I kind of akin him to what I've heard Stephen Kim Stephen King give an explanation of his writing style. He creates characters and the characters, he never thinks about why they do things or what they're doing things for. They just do them and he's just relaying the story to you. And I feel like this is very similar. Let's talk a little bit about the plot. We have Harper. She has decided to rent a gorgeous English cottage in the beautiful uh, countryside of England. I don't know exactly where she is. They say it in the movie, but I'm not familiar with England. Alex Garland is in fact British, so he would understand this better than anybody. It's clearly a couple hours. I think she says it's like somewhere between four and six hours outside of a major metropolitan area. Maybe it's London, not sure. But as we find out through, this, you know, through a series of flashbacks and things, she's trying to escape a past when she gets there she meets an English an interesting man who is the the person who's renting the thing to her what you have to understand about this is this is insanely well acted um jesse buckley not at first i was not the biggest fan of hers i don't know where she's from other than uh, wild rose the lost daughter i'm thinking of ending things i haven't seen any of those uh but she's from that and I thought she was very, very good. At first, I did not like her. English actor Rory Kinnear is absolutely phenomenal in this. And what's amazing about it is there are there's really only four actors in the entire thing. And I hope the budget was very small. The entire production, it seemed to be worth it to me. So you have Harper. You have her former husband. You have her sister... And then you have a series of men that she comes across. She rents this place. She rents it from a man. He says, there's only one key. We leave our doors unlocked out here. It's a beautiful place. We don't worry about these things. He's a little uh, off kilter, but that's just countryside England. That's okay. He explains to her different things, you know, they take a tour of the place and eventually she finds herself. She wants to go take a walk and discover, you know, the countryside. What she wants to recover from is, as, as we see the, in flashbacks, is that her ex-husband seemingly either fell off or jumped off. We, do, we don't really know what happened, uh, but he clearly she sees him falling from a building. And it's presumably in the city. 
And what's cool is everything's filmed in red. So I this is a super slow burn, and then the last 30 minutes of it get insane. Absolutely teddy bonkers. Um, but she goes on a walk, as one is ought to do in the English countryside, as I have heard from several people from England that there are no crazy wild animals. There are no wolves, no foxes, nothing. Well, maybe there's foxes, but there's no wolves. There's no predators. There's no mountain lions. There's no bears. There's no fauna to attack you. You can just walk through the English countryside. You will have an absolutely pleasant time. There's nothing to worry about except for people. So she goes on her hike. She finds a tunnel, like a bridge. And she goes in the bridge, and there's this really interesting scene where she's playing with the echo. And one thing that Alex Garland really likes to do is play with sound. And I think the sound dynamic and creation in this is pretty cool. She's like singing this like song along with her echo. And I heard some people criticize, like, oh, that's not how an echo works. And I have been in a giant tunnel. Echoes are pretty crazy. They sound pretty crazy. They do pretty crazy things. But what she notices is at the end of the tunnel, there seems to be a figure, and the figure seems to be chasing her. She leaves, she gets scared, there's rain, a lot of atmosphere, a lot of things going on. She ends up going, and she's running away, trying to get away, and she takes a picture as she walks into a field and looks back at this abandoned town, whatever it is, and she sees a naked man, a male figure. She goes back to her place, she's talking to her sister, and things seem to escalate because this naked man has now followed her back to the back to her remote residence and he is apparently stalking her and things continue to escalate um i forget at which point she goes and she talks to a priest and there's like a young boy wearing a mask of a woman and the young boy starts cursing at her and says calls her a the B word. And then you also have the priest who accuses her of pushing her husband into killing himself. So there's a lot going on here. The tension escalates with this man who is, who's uh, stalking her. The police come, they supposedly arrest him. Oh, there is one other female character in this. There's a female cop who's like sympathizes with her. Well, you start to realize is that all of the, maybe you did or maybe you didn't, that all of the male characters, except for her husband, are all played by the same actor, which I think is absolutely fascinating. And I did read a little bit about Rory Kinnear, and he says that he wrote backstories for each of the characters. Like, he spent a lot of time on this. It's, it's a real, it's real interesting and it, it really depends on your perspective as to whether or not, like how you interpret this film. But we'll continue with the plot. The police arrest this man, but she goes to the pub and she finds out that he has been released and seems mostly harmless. And all she runs into the housekeeper or the owner of the house again. And she feels very uncomfortable there where she feels the point that she needs to leave. At some point too, when she is at the church, she sees these figures, which will come into play. There's like a statue, and the statues of the green man, which I will explain if you did not understand that. There's a, a front side of the statue of the green man. The green man is the face of leafy figures coming out of his face, which is echoed in some of the characters that you see. And then on the reverse side is a female who is spreading her private areas, for lack of better terms, uh, giving birth in a sense. So it's, it's the front and back reverse. It will make sense as we go along. So as she is uh, returns back, she feels like she's being chased, harassed, hounded. And eventually, this is where we get to the climax of the film. We start to break down what exactly happened. We get a flashback of her husband. There's a fight. He says he's going to kill himself if she won't, if she divorces him. And she's like, well, you're threatening me and I don't want to hear it. And she escalates the violence. She's pushing him. And then at some point he punches her in the face. And then it escalates to the point where he kills himself. He throws himself out of a window or we don't know. She locks herself in, in the house. 
And we don't know if he's trying to get back in. We don't know if he throws himself off. But either way, he's staring at her as he falls. She goes outside to see his arm pierced. And it's very important to see this, that his arm is pierced by a uh, by a fence. And he has trouble walking. There's a whole thing to this. So eventually, uh, at one point, she feels the home is being invaded by this, this, this naked man. And the naked man is uh attacks her and, and puts his hand through the mail slot and she pierces his arm and slits his hand in half and then the final confrontation happens where you people are just gonna be like what is going on like it kind of blew me away it was very bizarre very strange um i won't go into graphic detail i'm hoping you've seen this because you're you're wondering to yourself what is going on here the the man who owns the house attempts to run her over with the car. She hits him with her car because she's trying to escape. And then she eventually ends up back in the house. And she's accosted by all of the characters that she's seen. Throughout all the male characters that she's seen through this. She's accosted by the child who is still being played by Rory Kinnear. She's accosted by the priest who attempts to um, have his way with her at one point. Um, but she's easily able to fend all of them off. She's uh, accosted by... And then at, at, at one point, the characters just start morphing into other characters. They're being born out of different orifices. And they walk forward crippled and can't seem to attack her and they just keep falling down and they keep giving birth to new characters until eventually the character is her husband and they both go inside and she sits down because she's she's done fighting and the character go she she says what do you want from me and her husband sits down next to her naked and he says i just want you to love me and then the entire thing closes with with her harper she's her sister she tells her sister what's going on at some point her sister says i'm gonna get there as soon as i can well she doesn't get there till the next morning and when she does get there she sees harper she sees the car has been damaged she sees harper sitting on the steps bleeding but she's smiling why is she smiling what has happened what is going on here how do we resolve all of this I the body horror aspect is something I really do like about Alex Garland. It's something that he included in not in Annihilation, which I enjoyed. I mean, I don't necessarily really like the movie is not one of my favorite movies, but I did enjoy the body horror aspect of it. I also enjoyed the body horror aspect of Ex Machina, which I think is absolutely fabulous. I've also watched Devs, which I'm I couldn't get all the way through. I just I didn't find it that interesting. I think it's a little bit too much. He was the writer of 28 Days Later, which people are, are very excited about. I mean, I've seen it. It's very good. This is his most recent project. And like I said, it came out on Hulu, and I think it's important that we talk about it. So let's uh, look at a little bit more in it. Again, people are looking on, and this is from The Atlantic. And The Atlantic goes, what is going on in these, these final scenes? I don't understand. Men is a brutal film with pathetic villains. That's because you don't understand what you're looking at. And let's connect it back to me too. Is men really about misogyny and hating women? Is it really about men? Or is it about the fact that men and women have men in the title? And that men and women are interconnected and there's something interesting that goes on here. And what this they're saying the movie's villains are revealed to be worthy of pity more than terror. So what exactly is going on here? In my estimation is that Harper's past weighs extraordinarily heavy on her. And I think what they're trying to show is it's manifested in this green man monster at some point you see that the the naked man has been inserting leaves into himself he's transforming into the green man and then slowly rebirthing himself into the different characters that she's 
you know, she doesn't know what's going on. The aggressive townsperson, the foul-mouthed child, the priest. What exactly are they attempting to, to say? And here's where they, you know, this description is, you know, the greens man, man's body begins to morph, revealing a pregnant belly. He rapidly gives birth to the school child, who gives birth to the vicar, who then spawns Jeffrey, who's the owner of the house. The final person to emerge is James, her husband, who sits down. What? And that's where they go. What does this all mean? I don't understand. And there, it's like a lineage of behavior. What I think he's trying to say is that he's, she's trying to resolve her trauma, and part of and and it just so happens to be a monster film. And what is interesting is that this was written way before the Me Too movement. This has nothing to do with Me Too. What it really has to do with the Green Man and the Sheila. Nagig, which is all part of English uh, history or folklore. England has a long history of folklore of these characters that are that have been carved into different churches. They're all over the place. On the front side, you have the man with leaves growing out of his face. And then on the other side, you have the woman uh, giving birth or, or being prepared to give birth. I, I, so I had to research a little bit of this because I've actually been to um, a garden that featured the Green Man, and I thought it was always interesting. So what you have is a mix of Catholicism or um, whatever they have in England, uh, not evangelism, whatever it is, the Anglican Church, that's what it is, and a mix of paganism. So you have these pagan images mixed with with these and it's very interesting because it, it all catches in you know it's connected to the green knight from authorian legend and robin hood jack and the green there's so much connected in the english history and alex garland was trying to place this in here where this woman goes to the countryside and experiences this kind of supernatural phenomenon that helps her resolve her own internal issues her guilt all of the things that she's been either punishing herself with and, and more, and what it resolves is, is she did actually love him and she wished she never did force him into the fact that she helped her husband kill himself. And I think that's what's important. And I think that people are maybe overanalyzing it and they're looking at it from their own perspective. If you're looking at it from this, you know, misogynism i i think you're you're mistaking it he says he'd been working on a version of the script for about 15 years and he even says himself those concepts predate me too and it's not about her being a victim harper's not a victim harper needs to resolve her issues and work through them emotionally and i really think that it's pretty interesting because it's the horror tale it's 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 tapping into folk horror um, which A24 is a big fan of. That's the studio that produced this. Obviously, uh, they have Ari, uh, Ari Aster, who's doing other things with folk um, horror from uh, you know some of his, his things with um, Hereditary and Midsommar. And here you have this movie, and it goes... There's even a reference in the beginning of that of Adam and Eve and eating the apple. She eats the apple, and he makes... The, the owner of the house makes a joke about it. It taps into your primal fears... But what she does is she overcomes all of it and she resolves it. And in the end, she, she's smiling because she's been through this experience but comes out stronger on the other side. And and he's like, I there's wildly different interpretations. And I think that's what he always does. That's what he wants you to do is interpret it your way. But he still puts guidelines on it. But you watch this movie and it, it's a ghost story. The young woman is, these are his words, the young woman is bereaved and goes to the countryside it gets essentially haunted by either the memory or the manifestation of her dead husband's sadness and anger. It should just be able to function like that if that's what people wanted. And I think that's really important. And uh, I thought it was really good. I enjoyed it. It was very bizarre. Some people will not get past the body horror. The last 30 minutes are absolutely bananas. But overall, I think it was a really effective movie. I enjoyed it. I thought the acting was just superb. Like I said, I was not the biggest fan of Jesse Buckley, but by the end, she she won me over. And you just, uh, he's always been a great actor, but uh, catching Rory Kinnear was just 
in each of the different roles was just kind of amazing. So I recommend it. Obviously, if you're watching this, you watched it too. Tell me what you think. Pretty sure I did my research and my interpretation is correct. There's an awful lot of people saying like, I don't understand it. I'm a big fan of folklore. English folklore has always been interesting, especially um, stories like Arthurian legends and things like that. It's, uh, it's fascinating. I thought this was a really cool take on it, especially someone who's from England writing a story to share his folk story with us. Tell me what you think in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed this one. It's another one of those Z explains something. Like, share, subscribe. It really helps us. I'll continue to do these if you so like them. If you want to comment below, encourage me to keep doing them. I did a one on Run Rabbit Run, which you guys really seem to enjoy. And I'm happy to do them. I love the dialogue. I check out all the comments. We have a full-length audio podcast that you can listen to us. It's a comedy. It's for free. It's... Uh, on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. We do a live stream of it on iTunes, or not on iTunes, on YouTube, right here. Come join us, Friday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We love all y'all. Thank you so much for listening, but I am on to the next one. <laughs>